Uh, so hi there, I'm Bill Ellis. Uh, I'm from Capgemini Engineering uh, in Bath from the United Kingdom. Uh, the office I uh, work in usually focuses on higher integrity software or embedded systems. Uh, since late uh, 2021, uh, funded through NCSC, a small team of engineers uh, between two and three have been working with SEL4. Uh, the names uh, attached to that project have changed over time. Uh, some of the names here have presented at earlier summits. Uh, uh, the list are shown in chronological order, which neatly shows that I'm one of the more recent joiners uh, to the effort. Uh, I'm the only one from the team who come here today. If I ask a bit too far for the rest of them. The others would love to be here. A little bit because of the sunshine, but a little bit also because they're really into SEL4. Uh, so if you have any questions for any of these names, uh, please pass them on to me and I'll, I'll pass them on to the guys. Oops, that way. Uh, so what's been our mission? To try to make it easier to get started working with the SEL4 microkernel. Uh, so it's not entirely selfless act. The idea is to try to kickstart or improve that, that cycle there. The easier it is to get started, the more people will join the community, uh, the more stuff they'll produce, and maybe the more useful contributions will come back to us. That, that's the idea. Uh, our personal contributions have been focusing more on SEL4 infrastructure, the bits around SEL4, the bits and bobs you need to get into using SEL4 itself. And all of our content is uh, publicly published. Uh, it's on that website right, right there. Uh, so today, uh, as, as this uh, initiative comes to a close, I'm going to talk about the consolidation of the overall SEL4 developer kit. I explore its approach and its major contributions. How do you go about trying to make SEL4 easier to be picked up by people and reflect on its uh, strengths and weaknesses? Oh, sorry. Oh. There we go. So our main contribution is the SEL4 developer kit. Uh, we didn't want to repeat content that had already been done by SEL4 itself. Uh, we wanted to focus on uh, contributions that were specific to SEL4, not general development uh, techniques. So we assume at the very beginning in the developer kit that our audience is people who are seasoned developers, they're familiar with SEL4 and its concepts and its benefits, and they just want to get started and up and running with SEL4. So we start with that assumption. Uh, the entirety of the developer kit is presented in a, in a book style website, so it's easier to navigate and bookmark and reference, and it's, it's publicly available so people can find it in Google Hits, etc. Uh, all of our available material is described on that website, and ultimately it's hosted through uh, GitHub in some manner. So the website is on GitHub as our, oh, they're not on the side, never mind, as our. Uh, all our, Git, all our Docker images, sorry, and uh, all of our code-based repositories are on GitHub. The general strategy behind that, uh, ah, there we go. <laughs> the general strategy behind the uh, developer kit is uh, to be specific. So we didn't want, we found that having general instructions that apply to multiple configurations just wound up being overly complex. So instead, we prefer having specific instructions for a particular configuration and assume that our experienced application, our experienced developer will be able to generalize wherever their own setup is. We deliberately try to make small incremental steps where each of these steps is backed up by some <clears throat> expected outcome. Uh, that way, the, the idea is that the developer will be able to grow their confidence and understanding in SEL4. So we can roughly split uh, the developer kit into two parts. There's everything up to first boot. If you like, that's the point where you can do hello world, yay. Uh, and then everything after that where you try to develop some meaningful application. So key features of the developer kit in getting to first boot is like I said, we're very specific. So we've picked a very specific target hardware, uh, the Avnet Maxboard. Uh, so this SBC has an ARM-based architecture. 
Uh, it's readily available, it's quite cheap, and it's got a host of devices, and perhaps most importantly, uh, a good uh, set of public documentation. Uh, it'd be silly to have a favourite Max board because they're all the same, but that's my favourite one that often sits on my desk. Uh, I've shown it there with some of its uh, peripherals plugged in to get a feel for uh, how many devices and things it supports. We identify uh, the minimal development platform that you would need to get started developing on, on that board. And we detail that uh, through a hardware shopping list, basically the minimum set of parts that you would need to go about setting that up, and the minimum amount of software that you need to do so. And we back that up through Docker images. So the main software dependency is Docker, and after that you can just get our Docker image to get all the dependencies for that. Uh, once we have once the developer's got those parts, then we detail the setup of that configuration platform. So we step through uh, the basics of wiring up their UART so they could do console access, uh, partitioning their SD card, uh, building the bootloader, putting the bootloader onto that SD card, and building and flashing the program image onto that. And once we have that, we have a small set of first boot examples, a frame for both cam keys and micro kits so the developer can get that, that early positive feedback that they're, they're able to build their own program and see it running. So I'm going to go into some of the details of that development platform. So the development platform is, if you like, all the infrastructure that you need from having uh, a program code to something running on the target. Uh, the host is where we build the, the program. So we use a separate Docker for the different frameworks. So we support both cam keys and microkit, but we have a separate Docker for each of them because they have quite different dependencies. In fact, in practice, they're both built from uh, different Debian uh, starting points. Uh, the cam keys has got a slightly earlier Debian, basically. And those deliberately just have the minimum amount of dependencies that are needed to support that framework to allow the developer to see precisely what it is that they're building on top of, and with the exception of some critical infrastructure, for example, Vim. Uh, but otherwise, it's just the, the, the minimal you need to get going. And maybe Vim is part of the minimal infrastructure you need to get going. For all of those, we prefer to build from source, uh, and I extend that to include the frameworks themselves, just to give full flexibility and transparency to the developer so they know exactly what it is that they're building on top of. The only real exception we make is for stock Debian dependencies, which are just pooled as uh, pre-built binary packages, which seems fair game. We initially started working with uh, just cam keys uh, back in 2021. That was the framework of choice. And later, we started to migrate across to MicroKit. It's quite interesting, some of the talks yesterday were actually talking about contrasting these two, and we had some of the same experiences. So we kind of think of MicroKit as having more features, and perhaps more constraints and more complexity, uh, loosely characterized perhaps as a monolithic framework. So in terms of our development, it's great, we could just use its libraries, in particular we used its standard C library, and we used its uh, DMA facility, and we also inherited its build system, so uh, Cam keys uses Git repo and CMake and Ninja. So it kind of fed into the way that we built our program code a lot. Uh, MicroKit, in, contra in contrast, sorry, has fewer features, uh, but also fewer constraints and uh, fewer, less complexity. Uh, so, make contrast it is the, the micro framework, which kind of feels quite fitting for SCL4 almost. Uh, of course, because there's fewer libraries, we had to incorporate the libraries that we needed when we needed them. But again, our footprint was quite small, so we needed a standard C library, so we got a standard C library from PicoLibC. We needed a DMA facility, so we annexed the one that was already available in cam keys. And at least we could easily point to those dependencies. We knew the bits that we needed that we were depending on top of instead of the much bigger core. MicroKit doesn't impose a build system in the same manner that CamKeys does. So we tended to pick whatever worked with the thing we were building against. So sometimes we're extending an existing system, and so we'd reuse its build system. And if we're just doing something a bit new ourselves, we'd probably just defer to using Make, because it's simple and straightforward. On the target side, uh, 
we chose the U-boot bootloader, uh, which is very capable. And in particular for the Max board, there's decent vendor support. It just works out the box for the Max board. Uh, we deliberately choose a very open configuration of that, so there's no secure boot, or for uh, ARM, there's no high assurance boot. And you could interrupt it into the console. The point being that this is the <laughs> developer kit to get it going. A hardened setup isn't appropriate. Uh, and just like for uh, the host, we prefer to build from source, so we show how the bootloader can be built from source. But we do have to make a couple of concessions for the Max board in that some of the firmware binaries that you need to boot that are only if it's publicly available in a binary form. Uh, what's it? The, the DDI5 and the HDMI firmware is only available in binary form. A U boot, sorry, the U boot bootloader is very customizable, so we can use the same binary irrespective as to whether we're cam keys or microkit, or even uh, how the developer wishes to place their image. So for example, uh, they could customize U boot using the UN.txt to select the location of the program image, be it a USB stick or an SD card or remotely via trivial FTP. And they can choose the format of the image as well. Uh, CamKey seems to favor ELF, and uh, MicroKit favors IMG. Uh, we depend upon the bootloader for initialization. So there's a, there's a bootloader on the Max board itself, which loads those uh, preparatory firmware to begin with. And then that loads the U-boot bootloader. We depend upon the U-boot bootloader to enable clocks and power domains for the devices. And then that U-boot bootloader finds and loads and starts our program image. Uh, so the main thing for stepping through the development platform is just to remind ourselves that our little program code sits inside this larger ecosystem and all these parts are still in play. Uh, we depend upon the bootloader for starting clocks and power domains, for example, and we can't just ignore that in the setup. Okay, so if that's us got to first boot, where do we go after that? Or from our point of view, what can we add to the developer kit to help people get up and running with SEL4? So we, uh, we choose to use standard SEL4 components. We, we don't want to provide a whole separate ecosystem, a whole separate framework. We don't want to tie the developer in something else. We want to build atop the, the classic SEL4 stuff. Uh, we want to prioritize capabilities that is likely to be needed by most developers, and so normally things like drivers and libraries. And we don't just want to uh, give them a pre-made solution, yeah, here's a driver. We want to kind of illustrate the development process. How did we go about making that driver? How do we go about making that library in the hope that the developer could see patterns that they could apply to their own problems? Uh, we choose to present that as a collection of uh, self-contained activities. So we're making them self-contained, the developer can see just what the dependencies are for that effort. And it also makes our life a little bit easier in that each activity can be described in a way that best fits that. And particularly, they could be allocated throughout the team over the long duration of the project. And each of these activities can be self-contained little packages. So it's an earlier version of the presentation where I tried to go through all of these in some detail. I'm not gonna do that today, I can't talk fast enough. So there is a whole load of activities out there. Uh, please go to the website, have a look at these and uh, come to me if you want any details of any of this stuff. Most of our effort has perhaps unsurprisingly been focused at developing drivers. Uh, so there's a, I'll get to them. <laughs> and uh, there's some examples which grow in complexity. Some of these uh, illustrate the use of the drivers that we've made. There's also quite a detailed uh, security-themed case study which shows step-by-step uh, -step how uh, you can build a secure application leveraging the assurances that SEL4 gives you. So trying to sell to the developer, this is a reasonable use case for SEL4. Uh, we, we, we dabble a little bit of virtualization. So if a few examples of how virtualization can be leveraged to get uh, richer functionality with, with top SEL4 quickly. And we also uh, have a small extension showing how we can extend the Max board with uh, a pressure sensor. So it's got a capability to add different devices to it. 
Uh, we even show how the host hardware could be extended to just make it easier to develop with the Max board. So we could remotely power cycle the Max board using a, a per, <coughs> excuse me, a per port power switching USB hub. Just makes life a little bit easier when you can remotely power cycle the thing in the lab. <coughs> and, oh, excuse me. At the top of all of that, uh, we have a bunch of guides or a bunch of extensions describing how the driver setups that we have could be extended to accommodate further drivers or extended to accommodate even different targets. So how would you go about moving what we have on the Max board to a different target hardware? <clears throat> okay. So device drivers are a very logical priority for the SCL4 dev kit. It's the fundamental compromise, if you like, of all microkernels, is that drivers become a user mode concern. And I think more than that, drivers are particularly complex. It's a mix of hardware, software, and large technical documentation, which is often incorrect or a bit quirky. It's, it's an obvious stumbling block. So our strategy has been to try to uh, provide a suite of different drivers, so <laughs> drivers for different devices, but more than that, to provide those drivers in different ways by reusing uh, what's out there uh, and in different styles. Uh, the hope is that, great, the developer might find exactly what they're looking for, but if they can't, maybe they'll find a pattern in how we went about finding drivers uh, that they could reuse for their setup. Uh, so previous uh, patterns that we've uh, shared, so we've ported the U-boot boot loader has within it a whole bunch of drivers that sit inside uh, a driver framework. So we ported that framework across to SEL4, which gave us access to its driver pool. Uh, I'm not going to dive into that today because I can't talk fast enough. But there was a previous talk by Stephen at an earlier summit, so please check that out on YouTube if you're interested. Another pattern we did was where we ported a specific driver and a few of its related drivers uh, to give a XHCI or a USB driver functioning atop the Max board uh, ported out of uh, NetBSD. Excuse me. And again, uh, if you wish further details on that, please look at Joshi's uh, talk at the previous summit. So I'm going to explore uh, a further reuse pattern today where we uh, blend different resources to uh, make a, a device, a display driver, sorry. So in contrast to the other patterns, the idea here is that uh, multiple resources are available and we might be able to pick and choose amongst them to try to make a new driver from that set. So the resources available to us, uh, the vendor of the, the Max board has a fork of U-boot where they've plopped in a permissively licensed HDMI transmission driver, which is needed to do display on the Max board. Uh, the vendor also has a soup of useful documentation that explains how the Maxboard devices work. And just more generally, there's lots of stuff out there. Linux has got drivers and there's lots of documentation about how display drivers can be assembled. So the Maxboard itself has, of course, display is quite complicated. It has multiple ways that the display can be controlled. Uh, but one of the ways it can be done is by using the display controller subsystem to drive the HDMI transmitter, which in turn drives the display. Uh, we chose uh, for simplicity. We, we don't have, we're, not, we're not providing a display controller subsystem driver. We're not providing an HDMI transmitter driver. We're providing a display driver, which encapsulates the two of these together, uh, which simplifies the interface for that. So our approach is we basically reused with very minor changes, the permissively licensed driver from uh, the vendor. And uh, we created our own DCSS uh, driver uh, incrementally. So reading from the available material, Linux, et cetera, uh, we've, we worked out how to draw some dots to begin with, yeah. And once we'd cracked that, 
we uh, just incrementally improved its functionality. So we extended it to control the resolution and display static images. And once we had that, uh, the Maxport has uh, three pipelines for controlling the display. So we used two pipelines uh, toggling between the two to do double buffered images and to create uh, uh, moving images. Uh, the API to that is really very straightforward. Uh, the user prepares the image data in the format that the Maxboard uh, display controller expects and is just presented with buffers to that data, uh, one for the static image and two for the moving images, uh, just alternating with the different images to, to, to do things moving. Uh, the outcomes for that, it was a very self-contained code base. Uh, the other examples, for example, porting the U-Boot driver framework, whole lot of code. The NetBSD driver is very large. This was very small and compact. It's quite interesting the users of the DevKit can compare these different driver solutions. And it's very specific to uh, the system on chip on board the Max board because it's quite tightly coupled to its display controller. And it's intended for simplicity and understanding. This is not a high performance device driver. This is not for playing your video games, etc. This is just something a developer could use to demonstrate to themselves so they can begin drawing to the screen. Oh, and yeah, there's a weird glitch. <laughs> when transitioning between the double buffered images, there is an absolutely momentary, momentary screen wipe that you can see as the Max board is transitioning between the two, which we can never get to the bottom of. Uh, we, we flipped it on its head to say device drivers are difficult, yeah? And sometimes, even following the spec to the letter, they can still have unusual quirks and behaviors. So we also added uh, little, bits, little bits of activities in the developer kit to explore the use of virtualization as uh, a flexible alternative for enhancing capability. So We've covered this in earlier sessions, really. It's a very obvious technique. Uh, stick the capability that you want inside a Linux guest and pass that and run that on top of SEL4 and uh, somehow share that uh, behavior elsewhere. We focused exclusively on the, uh, the MicroKit solution. So that's uh, SEL4, MicroKit, LibVMM hypervisor, uh, SDDF, and then Linux guest only. And our contribution for this, it really is just around packaging. So we've basically stolen all of the MicroKit LibVMM examples and packaged it in a manner so that people using the dev kit could see what uh, options are out there. Uh, so one thing we had to do was to prepare uh, a Linux guest for running on the Max board. So we used the, uh, the build root uh, system for creating embedded Linux guests. We basically took its uh, default configuration, but tailored for our target architecture, ARM, and just used its mainline Linux kernel. And we just threw out everything not uh, particular to our own architecture. The only real quirk we had was uh, the ARM SMC, Secure Monitor Call, includes an SIP, a target specific uh, function. Uh, and one of those is referenced by a Linux driver to get the version of the Max board. So we made a tiny patch to the MicroKit libvmm so that when that request was made to the hypervisor rather than the, uh, the metal, it would give the correct version number and allow the driver to proceed. We've seen this strategy elsewhere. Uh, there's kind of two different ways you can reuse behavior from a virtual guest using virtualization. I, I, I frame them as direct or indirect. For a direct is you pass through the device directly into the virtual guest, and the second is indirect, where a native driver receives the device, which then provides a virtual, a virtual view of that device to one or more uh, guests. Uh, the indirect style is more flexible, uh, as it permits you to share the device. <laughs> so we use the, uh, the MicroKit solution to present two very simple examples that illustrate those two different uh, strategies. So we uh, directly pass the UART into a Linux guest to give simple console access. 
one of the interesting quirks of that is that because we passed in the physical UART and used the physical Linux driver, that physical Linux driver has dependencies on clocks and a whole bunch of other device drivers. And so we had to give that Linux guest a lot more devices than we really wish to do so. In contrast to the indirect setup where we used, we passed a UART into a multiplexer with a native physical driver, which then passed Virtio console into the Linux guests. There, for th for the Linux guest who's using the Virtio console driver, there's no additional dependencies on top of that, so it didn't need to see all these other devices. Uh, the other quirk we had while we were developing that was that the Linux guest assumed it was the only operating system in town, and so turned off all of the clocks it was unaware of, including the clock that the native UART driver was using to keep itself happy. Uh, so we had to tell the Linux guest not to do that which is an interesting quirk. Another thing we wished to do was our USB routing. I think I'm short on time, so I'll skim through this a little bit. Uh, the simple premise here is that uh, we wish to route one, a, a USB device through a common port, but to different guests. Our initial plan for this was to reuse a feature from the XHCI specification. Unfortunately, it's tagged as an optional normative HCI feature, which is not actually implemented in any hardware anywhere. So that didn't quite work. Our next plan was try to use something a bit like Vertio, uh, I guess Vertio hyphen USB, but that doesn't exist either. But I think because the XHCI spec is about as simple as it can get, there, there isn't a way to make it any simpler. The next plan was try to blend the stack using existing resources. But while there's a whole lot of XHCI drivers out there, there's not quite a lot of emulated XHCI controllers out there. And we found it quite difficult to find the components we need to frame that. So the backup was to use uh, something called USB IP inside the Linux kernel. So this is an off-the-shelf solution that lets us do exactly what we wanted to do. It can route uh, USB traffic from a given device to a chosen uh, guest. The only downside to this is we need a virtualized network solution, which was in progress while we were working on this. Uh, so we finally decided to uh, pivot and describe it as an exercise for the reader. So <laughs> we did some workarounds, yeah, we proved the basic solution worked. Uh, not on SCL4, using just bare li metal Linux. Uh, we didn't want to put anything out there that was a little bit uh, crumbly, so we decided to pick it that way. Uh, so there we are. So the SCL4 dev kit is there, public, and it exists to help people get up and running with SCL4. It's not rocket science, but in some way that sits point, yeah? It's supposed to be straightforward, easy steps to get into SCL4. It's got a suite of self-contained activities. Some of those might be directly useful to the developer. They might literally use that driver. Or some might be indirectly useful. They might see a pattern that fits what they're trying to do, and that helps them get started. And I guess another one that comes is another little pack of engineers <laughs> very far, far away who have some SEL4 experience. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. ask Jason to start switching computer and we'll take um, one quick question from the audience. The question, well, I'll ask one. So you're talking about addressing the need for easy access for users. Do you have a way to track who is using the SDK and get feedback from it or inversely have a track of what the needs are that you want to target? What are you doing, I guess? Well, of course, the SCL4 is quite secure, so it's, uh, people can't... I got one or two seconds. Actually, one of the main people that did come out to us... Oh, we might as well do two pieces. Outside. One of the people that did come out to us were another branch of Capgemini, so we do know it is get being used. Okay. Uh, so I guess Capgemini were happy to talk to us. Uh, but, yeah. Can you get some feedback through that on the SDK, for instance? Yeah, we, we know we helped them get up and running, so okay. yeah. 